on this wonderful day. And uh, we're thanking God for his, uh, for his goodness on today. And uh, we thank God for being alive. And uh, God is just so good, so good, so good to us. So we are uh, most appreciative of, of that. And we're thanking you. Thank you for tuning in on today. And uh, so we're excited about our speaker, who we'll introduce just uh, shortly in a little bit. But uh, we've got some good things that we'll talk about and discuss on uh, during the service and on the show this morning. So we're excited about that today and excited that you've joined us. And I want to say welcome to uh, Rainbow Community Praise Center. We're here in Fontana, California. And the uh, objective of our uh, weekly broadcast is to provide relevant information to inspire the nation and to empower a generation. And uh, we always take a moment each week just to uh, share, get an idea where you're uh, watching from. And so I know that there are those who are watching on YouTube, some are watching on Facebook, uh, and if you would, some are watching uh, via Zoom. And if you would, just give us an idea where you are uh, watching from, because we'd love to acknowledge you. And also, if you would, uh, please indicate any praise reports, praise reports that you might have. Uh, you can just put praise report and then colon, share whatever it is. Or you can put prayer requests, colon, and then share whatever it is so that those doing the, um, the uh, um, praise uh, testimonial time will know, and those doing the uh, intercessory prayer will know. We have Elder Nola calling in from Beaumont, California. So glad to have you on today. And we have Elder Philip uh, listening and watching in. He says the Inland Empire. The Inland Empire is so large. Inland Empire probably has at least... 20, 30, maybe even 30 cities in it, but he wanted to be general like that with us today. So it's all good. Um, and so we're excited about uh, those of you who are joining from the various places. Also around the country, we realize that we are a multiple time zone uh, show. And so there are people watching not only across the country, but also globally. Outstanding. All righty, let's see. Let's really make sure that um, uh, Elder Allen is able to speak to us. It does everyone uh, who needs to be able to speak to us, if they can speak to us today. Um, so at this time, we're going to ask Elder Allen if he would lead us in our uh, prayer time, opening prayer. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Let us pray. Eternal loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts. We thank you for giving us another opportunity to uh, enjoy the service this morning, dear God, and we ask for your blessings. We ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be in our midst, dear God. We pray that you would open up our eyes to see the things that you have for us this morning. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Elder Allen, for that. This time, we're going to ask uh, Elder Philip if he lead us in our testimonies. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, we have so much to be uh, praising God for Uh God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Amen. So, uh, is there anyone who would like to share a testimony of God's goodness uh, on today, on this morning, or afternoon, depending on where you're calling from or watching? Well, as you all are uh, uh, possibly getting your thoughts together, I'd like to thank God uh, today for... Um, uh, the rain that uh, we are receiving in my location in Southern California. I can't remember when's the last time we had rain. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's been more than two, three months, four, maybe five months. But uh, uh, I'd like to thank God for for the rain today. i also like to thank God uh, that uh, my youngest 
child, my son Christian, he turns or he turned eight today. Uh, that's a blessing. And uh, and uh, also, uh, I like to praise God for the for the uh, news reports that are going across uh, uh, the nation about uh, uh, Joe Biden mm -hmm. uh, 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 to be our uh, president. So uh, I have a whole lot to be thankful for and uh, and glad about. So mm -hmm. uh, I give God praise for that. Amen. 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 And God, God really loves your son. Gave him for his birthday present a new president. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so your your son is really favored by God to get a that kind of pre, that kind of present Amen. on his birthday. God. Outstanding, man. Man, that's a blessing on a high level. Yes, I'm it trying is. to tell yes, you. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, is there anyone else who'd like to share a testimony uh, this morning? I can share. Uh, I am uh, just grateful to God. I uh, had a moment to uh, just step away on Tuesday. My wife and I de uh, disengaged for a moment uh, on election day. We didn't we didn't watch anything, anything to dealing with the elections at all. All day Tuesday, we traveled down to Sa San Diego, I had a wonderful time. And it was just just before retiring, I think about eight or nine o'clock. On Tuesday evening, we uh, watched a little news, but after that, uh, that was it. Uh, you know, each evening, one time, that was it. We kind of checked in, but just to get out of the stress and the constant barrage of updates and alerts, it was so uh, happy to do that. And it's always a blessing, and it's so refreshing to be near the water. You know, just just wonderful, just wonderful. And uh, so that was a blessing. It was almost like the elections weren't even going on and a change of pace was pleasant. Also, uh, when we got ready to go home, cars packed and everything. Um, we get in, uh, my wife gets in the car, starts the car, uh, and the car doesn't start. Packed, loaded everything in front of the mm -hmm. hotel, car does not start. I said, okay, this is, this is not good, but I'm saying, okay, I'm going downstream, going with the flow. Never, mm -hmm. never, never, you know, upset, never, mm -hmm. you know, uh, out of sorts. And, um, and then later on, oh, also I discovered that the engine light came on. So I said, okay, God, I'm not getting a tow all the way from <laughs> San Diego back home. Okay, so that's out. So, so, so I need you. To take us back, well, how many miles is it, uh, Elder Philip? Because you drive it every day, so you I don't know how many miles is that. Uh, a little over ninety. A little over ninety. Okay, I say, okay, God, I need you to take the wheel and take the car and bring us all the way back ninety miles so that we can get back in the pocket. And uh, and sure enough, we did, and uh, was able to take it. Oh, my wife had a an eye appointment first thing, and so we had to take her there. Car stopped again, the eye point appointment, and then uh, we were able to get it started driving to the mechanic. And the uh, mechanic discovered that the, what does he call that? Oh, my goodness. Uh, some, some with the uh, crank, it was a crank mm -hmm. sensor. I think it was a crank sensor. It, uh, it went out. So, you know, it wasn't even $300. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, said, I said, God, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. And so just really thankful to God for his goodness because, you know, it could have been 1800 It could have been 3000 You know what I mean? And so I just mm -hmm. thank God for his goodness. Amen. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing how... How uh, you were in uh, uh, the land that I like to uh, visit. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Well, uh, is there anyone else who'd like to share before we transition? Yeah, let's see. All right. Well, uh, Apostle. All righty then. All righty then. Well, it is offering time, time for all of us to, to sow and also to grow. Amen. And so we encourage each of you to give a give a thank offering on today. Amen. So whatever you're going to give, put a little extra on it as a thank offering that God has got us out of this tyrannical, uh, oppressive bondage. 
Amen. For, uh, you know, for this season. And so we thank God for that. And whenever, whenever God did something great for, for Israel, they always, always erected an altar and gave an offering. So we encourage you to give and to sow into this ministry for the great things that we are trying to do uh, here uh, in this area of the vineyard. On next week, next week we're excited uh, to have, um, I was moving so quickly, I didn't mention our QR codes. You can also, you can give by uh, the QR codes, Cash App and Venmo. Uh, so excited about getting to our, uh, for our speaker for next week, none other than Donna Green Goodman. Uh, Donna Green uh, Goodman is a health educator, author, and cancer survivor. Her uh, topic of discussion next week will be, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. So uh, she's going to talk to us uh, about, about her testimony and, uh, and about her story, and then also talk to us about uh, what, you know, what happens uh, and how you relate to uh, this issue of, uh, of cancer, really. And so we appreciate her. She comes to us from, um, from Huntsville, Alabama, health educator, Arthur, cancer, cancer survivor. And so we look forward to having her on uh, next week. At this time, we're going to ask Elder Nola if she would lead us in our intercessory prayer time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All praises to him. Do we have any special prayer requests this morning? I'm looking at the board. I don't see anything. Okay. All right. So very good. Heavenly Father, giving you praise today. Giving you praise today. Oh, Father, we just thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to watch over us and bless us and you hear our prayers. Thank you, Father, that you have paid attention and honored the prayers of your people and you've been able to bless us. Thank you, Lord, for watching over every person on the call today and their families, their prospective families. We thank you, Lord, that you've watched over the um medical professionals that are dealing with COVID and all of the um, backlash from the COVID-19 pandemic. We thank you, Father, for the essential workers that you continue to keep uh, out there working diligently. We just lift them up and ask that you would continue to watch over them and bless them in Jesus' name. We lift up the families of the 230,000 people who have lost their lives because of COVID. And we ask, Father, that you would touch them, that you would comfort them, that you would also, Father, do a healing work, a mighty healing work in the United States and globally, Father, yeah. in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you hear the prayers of your people. And as you hear them, we see you answering them and we give you praise. We know that there have been prayer requests that have not been um, uh, identified on our line, but you know them. And as, as a result, we ask, Lord, that you would touch them in the name of Jesus and do a healing, answering work, a Jehovah Rapha work, a Jehovah Jireh work in the name of Jesus. We lift up um, all of our birthday recipients, Father, Sister, Sister Kiara Thomas, and Brother Christian Gray, we thank you, Lord, for their lives. We thank you for keeping them healthy. We thank you, Lord, that they can claim another birthday, and we give you praise for that. We thank you for our apostle and his family. We ask that you would continue to bless him, and as he every week provides us with relevant excellent um, messages. We pray that you will continue to bless him, keep his family, keep his mind steadfast on you. And we thank you, Lord, for watching over all of his family as well. We lift up First Lady and ask that you will continue to bless her, keep her healthy, and meet her needs in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We ask that you will watch over Sister Susan Watkins, Lord, who's recovering from surgery one of our dear members, we ask that you would bless her and, and continue with her um, healing work, Father, that she would be blessed and totally healed in the name of Jesus. 
And now, Father, we lift up Sister Claudia Allen. We thank you, Father, for her being able to spend time with us today to bless us with some words from you. We ask that you would bless her life, that you would touch her family, and that the message that she brings, Father, would open up our eyes, open up our ears to hear yet another word from you. We thank you for blessing us today. We thank you for ministering to us today. We thank you for all that you do for us today. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Elder Nolo. We appreciate that uh, prayer. And uh, each week we uh, deal primarily with two things, and that's Black Lives Matter and then uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID so we are uh, going to hit that again today and make sure, just making sure we're always relevant. And as we say each week, um, the Black Lives Matter is so much more than just a mural, right? Last week, we uh, had a conversation about the, uh, the Office for Regional Conference Ministry. Uh, the statement that they made on Sunday, October 25th, uh, 9.45 p.m., concerning uh, clergy sexual misconduct in, in the ranks across North America. And uh, they provided at that time a seven point pledge, seven point pledge to the constituents, largely saying that they were taking the allegations of sexual misconduct seriously, that they were applying the 1994 uh, North American Division policy on sexual harassment, and uh, again, that these things would be adjudicated properly and objectively, and that people would not be simply moved to different churches, different cities, and different conferences. And as I mentioned last week, I simply said, prove it. <laughs> I simply said, prove it, right? Because uh, it, the reality is the policy was established in 1994, 26 years ago, and that behavior we have seen over and over and over again since then. So, so, so our challenge is prove it and regain the sacred trust, because to, to, to be pastor and spiritual leader is a sacred trust. So I say, and many have said, prove it. Let's, let's see it happen, right? And then, so not only what, you know, what, uh, what they are saying in their six, seven point pledge, let's make that happen, but also let's listen, let's listen to the women. Let's listen to the women and see what the women are saying about women in representation, women in leadership and, and the pain and the triggers. Let's listen, listen. Men, we gotta be quiet a minute and just listen so that we can understand this and handle this properly. This is a watershed moment. And uh, we know that challenges and difficulties can be turned to opportunities if we handle them right. So I didn't want that to get past us. I didn't want us to miss that. And the other thing is, when we going to know something, <laughs> right? There's an investigation going on. Yeah, okay then. So how we going to know? When we going to know something? Give us some time frames, all right? So again, we're dealing with trust rebuilding trust. So critical, critical, critical matter. Also, as we think about uh, Black Lives Matter, we're excited and elated that God has delivered us from the, the tyranny and the oppression of uh, Donald, Day Trump, Donald J. Trump, right? Uh, and so we are, are happy about uh, President-elect Joe Biden, 46th President of the United States, and also elated, elated that uh, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, uh, first female vice president of the United States, uh, vice president elect, right? So we're excited about that. And just, just a new day, just a historic moment. Uh, we know that um, there will be other issues that have brought, brought to bear. We know the legal challenges that have gone out and, and we know that uh, the, the, the pot will be stirred and negative things will, you know, be brought to bear. But that's where we come in as the praying saints, right? Because the prayers of the righteous avail of much. So we got to stay focused and stay prayed up. Prayed up. So excited about that. And I, 
And I was talking to uh, Claudia earlier before we started the uh, service, and, and I was telling her, in some ways, I'm excited and happy, but in a real sense, black people have just gotten back to zero, y'all. I'll just let that simmer in for a moment. Black people have just gotten, because we were at like negative 40 with him, uh, with Donald J. Trump as the, as the president. Now we're just getting back to, to zero, right? So don't rest, maintain, maintain vigilance. And, uh, you know, Stacey Abrams and what she did there in Atlanta and Georgia, she's a rock star. She's the truth. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit more about her on my next slide, but I'm just so excited uh, today. Sorry about that little negative damper, but you know, if we can't, if we can't be truthful and completely analyze our situations, we really can't go forward. And so I wanted to do that. So. Uh, I wanted to talk about the voter suppression efforts, right? The block the vote campaign, the block the vote movement. And that's been going on since Jim Crow, right? Uh, that is not new to us, but we've seen what voter ID laws that have made it difficult. Pe people needing, twi people needing um, you know, IDs to vote. And what, we, what we've come to understand, they're like, uh, like 20 million uh, folks who don't have governments, uh, government produced, government sanctioned uh, uh, IDs. Uh, number two, voter registration restrictions. That brings back to mind the, the black codes, right? When you had to two, do two back flips, uh, a split, and then count the number of beans in the jar, right? Crazy, ridiculous foolishness. Then there was the voter purging that's going on. And we saw that with Kemp. Uh, in Georgia, and that's really why uh, Stacey Abrams lost at such a thin margin there in Georgia. Then, um, and and, and uh, then uh, four felony disenfranchisement. So you know, if you become an offender, then you can never vote again. That's really problematic. Why? Because black and Latino folks are locked up disproportionately because the system works against us and not for us. And so oftentimes we don't even belong there. And then we lose a privilege, uh, a political privilege for the rest of our lives. That's a problem. Five gerrymandering that takes place every 10 years with the census. And, um, you know, uh, uh, they're cutting these districts so far for political advantage. So what's the effect? 70% of uh, Georgia voters were purged. 70%? What? 70% of the Georgia ver uh, voters that were purged in 2018 were black. And that's, that's, that's when Stacey Abrams was running for governor, the gubernatorial race there, right? Nationwide, one out of 13 black Americans cannot vote due to disenfranchisement laws. One out of 13 black Americans cannot vote due to disenfranchisement laws, right? One of three voters who have who have a disability report difficulty voting so it is not user friendly for those who have disabilities uh, one in three are challenged with that only 40 percent of polling places fully accommodate people uh, who have disabilities nationwide counties with larger minority populations have fewer polling sites and fewer uh, poll workers per voter, right? So they just make it difficult in the minority areas because they know that uh, minority folks tend to be Democratic supporters. And so we're gonna, they're going to say, well, for this whole county, we'll have one or two polling places, which is ridiculous. Uh, also, it was discovered that six, uh, six out of 10 college students from the state of New Jersey and some other southern states, uh, they tried to block them and su suggesting that only folks uh, who uh, uh, block residents without uh, out of state with out of state licenses from voting. Uh, so that's problematic because everybody leaves their state and goes to another state, not everybody, but many people leave state and go to another state to to vote. And so uh, so those kinds of challenges exist. And what's wonderful, uh, folks, is that uh, in spite of that, uh, in spite of that, we have good news to talk about today. So this article comes from The Guardian. Uh, Kenya Evelyn uh, writes this on yesterday. 
It says how young black voters lifted Biden's bid for the White House. Be, let's be clear, right? Black people put Biden in office and I ain't playing. <laughs> I am not playing. Uh, young people, uh, black voters in urban areas delivered the vote for President-elect Joe Biden, right? That's PA, that's Pennsylvania, that's Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan. According to the exit polls, black, black voters overwhelmingly backed Biden by a margin of 87% to Donald Trump's 12%, right? 87%, that's huge. We weren't playing. Uh, young people turned out in record numbers with uh, 4 in 10, that's 40%, uh, 40 4 in 10 eligible black voters being millennials or from Generation Z, right? So they was making it happen, y'all. 40% of eligible voters, 40% of black eligible voters were young people. Right. And they made it happen in Philly and ATL and in Milwaukee and Detroit. Those were the battleground states. Those were the places. Those were the people who changed the game. Right. And so so it's so exciting because we can do so much when we're mobilized, according to the polling data analysis by AP and, and Tufts University, black voters under 30. 88% voted for Biden and only 9% voted for Trump, right? So they were taking this serious. And of course, I say, I said it earlier, Stacey Abrams is a rock star. She won the White House, y'all, without being on anybody's ballot. <laughs> that's, that's black girl magic if I ever heard of it. She won the White House without being, she flipped the state. That has not been a blue state since 1992, Bill Clinton, all right? So that's, that's the real deal. That's, that's, that's saying something, all right? So uh, let's keep these things in mind. So, so much work to do. Again, we're just getting back to zero. Uh, we've got new coalitions that are being, being built. We've got to learn to play the long game. We've got to see, we've got to think in terms of the next presidential election. We've got to think about the midterms now. Uh, we've got to think about these gubernatorial races. We've got to think about these judges um, that are, that are uh, being voted in locally, these DAs. And so uh, really let's stay vigilant. Uh, we can't rest, celebrate tonight, but, <laughs> but let's stay vigilant. All right, let's move on to uh, COVID-19. COVID-19, we won't spend a lot of time on that today since we spent so much time on the uh, Black Lives Matter and election. But I'll just simply say, uh, give us our our figures globally, uh, 50 million cases of COVID-19 and 1.2 million deaths globally. In the United States, 9.7 million cases and three, uh, 237 deaths, 237,000 deaths, 237,000 deaths. I can't even believe I'm saying that almost a quarter of a million, right? And uh, in the last three days, while folks were out voting, um, and I, I didn't say anything about that, the mail-in votes, and I, I mentioned it last week, but what a day before, by a day before, um, half, half of Americans had voted <laughs> the day before. That is amazing. And, and of course, Joe Biden got more votes than anybody else. You can see I really want to talk about this today, right? But anyway, three days this week, we've had uh, over 100,000 cases per day. That's huge. So, um, so thank God help is on the way. We know that Trump really wasn't interested in doing anything. But what we do know, what we do know, we do know is that if we wear the mask and we maintain the social distancing and and not being cavalier and just kind of doing what we have to do we can cut down um on the on the spread and and we can keep from getting uh those 130,000 uh new uh new cases so and we can save lives uh I should say not cases but lives saved all right so uh let's stay safe folks let's stay masked uh let's stay distanced 
and uh, and let's avoid the large um, the large parties and and if you can if you're moving outside of your family for Thanksgiving uh, please find a way to uh, ensure that those in, uh, involved are tested because what did we say 40% of um, of those who have COVID are asymptomatic so that's that's real serious and of course in two weeks we'll have uh, Dr. Milton Brown with us again. As you know, he comes to us each month and gives us our COVID-19 update. All right. Well, I'm excited. We have uh, our special guest, uh, uh, Claudia, Claudia Allen, on with us on today. And, uh, and she's looking forward to being with us. And I want to ask you, just take a moment and set those, set, set those watch parties up. Take a moment and set those watch parties up because you don't want your friends and family members to miss it. They might not be able to find Rainbow, but they can find you. And so uh, take a moment to set up those uh, watch parties and uh, we're going to get started and uh, we're going to interview, uh, introduce Claudia right now. So our guest for today, we are so excited and we're privileged really. We're privileged because Claudia, ooh, sorry about that M before your name there. Claudia speaks all over the place. I said, Claudia, how often do you speak? And she said, uh, she said she might speak, preach, appear on panels anywhere from three to five times a, a week. That's a job. <laughs> and she's so good at it. She's so dynamic. She's so thoughtful. She's so brilliant. And so we're excited to have her on today. Uh, I didn't know her when she was a younger person growing up in, there in, uh, in uh, Michigan, but certainly uh, was there with her grandparents and her uh, aunts uh, there as I uh, visited the, and actually worked at the Niles uh, Church in, um, in Niles, Michigan, in um, Lake Region Conference. So uh, in the way of introduction, Claudia M. Allen is the online content manager at Message Magazine, holding a bachelor's degree from Andrews University and uh, a master's from Georgetown University. Most recently, she completed the first uh, certificate program in theology and, rat and, and racialized policing with uh, sojourners and the Howard University Divinity School. She is a public speaker and writer on race, anti-racism, and biblical social justice, who is contributing author to uh, the recent publication, Preaching Black Lives Matter, by the Reverend Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart. Uh, Claudia is excited about her forthcoming book, uh, Activate, Finding the Savior in Social Justice. Finding the Savior, Savior in Social Justice. I love that title. A book that is birthed out of her passion to activate uh, the activists in all of us. Amen. So please, if you would, uh, join us uh, right now, uh, Claudia. And uh, we're so excited, to, uh, so excited to to have you can Hello, you oh Dr. there you are there you are all right it is a pleasure to be here thank you so much for inviting me yes ma'am glad to have you with us today and i know you've already gone through your service i didn't mention you were the uh the church clerk at uh, the emmanuel Brin yes. brinkalo church there and mm -hmm. uh and you have done your duties already and now you are uh, all geeked and ready to be with us. You couldn't talk about it because the news was breaking Listen. <laughs> while you were preaching, right? News are breaking while you were Absolutely. preaching, right? <laughs> my, I love my home church. They call me the preaching clerk over there. Yes. So, uh, definitely preach this morning. We're in our Daniel series. And so I preached Daniel 6, preached Daniel in the lion's den. All and, right. Uh, a sermon entitled Creating a Criminal and talking about uh, connecting Daniel and our mass incarceration problem. But ultimately, the truth is, is that even as uh, in Daniel 6, we see Daniel uh, literally in a, tr a moment of a transition of power, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's coming out, immediately coming out of the Babylonian Empire, right into the Medo-Persian Empire uh, with King Darius and King Cyrus. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are similarly in that moment. We are yeah. in that period yeah. where we too are experiencing a transition of power, but we have this hope in the book of Daniel and in the story of Daniel uh, that regardless of 
how many kings move and how many kings come, God is still in control. God yes, will still give us favor and God still will deliver. So Amen. Amen. Outstanding. And I and I had to I had to I had to raise my glass a little earlier this this yes. morning. <laughs> I still don't got no bubbly. I got to go get right, some right, bubbly. That's right. That's right. And we had to do we had to do an online toast because yes. we've got a new we've got a new president new uh, uh, coming president. on the scene uh, on the scene. And so and so we can start with that because I mean we got to always be relevant. That we've got stuff we want to talk about. Let's start with here though. So okay. what are your thoughts concerning uh, this recent election, the outcome? Just any thoughts that you have and. And, and I know it's still in process, right? But just give us, share some of your thoughts with us about it. And, and yeah. incidentally, I did catch you on Tuesday night too. I was, doing, I was doing some work and I sat down to eat and I caught you on the panel with uh, Dr. Crichton and, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and the other folks and Dr. Shindell, my good friend. And so, so I did catch that. So share She's some things fabulous. with us. Yeah, so... Um, I think that this is definitely probably what I would consider to maybe be the most important election um, in modern American history. Um, and I think that that was felt throughout the country. And I think that you can see that reflected as states turned blue. Um, states that you wouldn't think turned blue, turned blue. Um, and I think that it is because so many of us just really went out of our way, voted in droves, voted early, um, and really did the best that we could to make sure that our votes got counted. Um, and we are still in that counting process. And so uh, I'm telling everyone to continue to be patient. Um, you know, even historically outside of a pandemic, military absentee votes are oftentimes not counted until about nine, 10 days, let's say between seven and 10 days after election day. So that's without the pandemic, right? So we're seeing that a lot of these states are coming in and yes, they are 89 or 92 or 97% uh uh, counted. And so that's really what that means is that, you know, one, we're either waiting for military ballots or we are still counting mail-in ballots. We're still counting uh, the drop box ballots that we did out here in Maryland where I live. Um, and so that's, that is where we are. But just like you said, Dr. Thomas earlier, uh, we have to shout out black women. Um, black women went to work yes. on this election. Yes. I mean, Stacey Abrams did a monumental task of flipping Georgia in the, in the heat of this kind of civil unrest. Um, and I have to credit her for her phenomenal work. I have to credit um, so many people of color who volunteered to be uh, poll judges and, 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 and ballot counters. Um, you know, so many uh, polling places were reaching out uh, because individuals who typically do this are usually over the age of 50 and 55. True. And now we are in a pandemic and they are the individuals who cannot be out doing this. And so these polling places were like begging for young people to, right. to come out. I even tried to, to do it. And my polling place was like, yo, we're full, we're good. <laughs> um, but you know, young people were really, you know, the, I had so many older people telling me, Claudia, you got to be a judge, be a judge. Cause I can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, we really just want, I just want to commend the people of color and the young people that really came out and said, you know what, we are not going to let these militias come out here and intimidate voters. We are not going to allow any administration to not fully count all of the votes. Uh, and we're just going to make sure that this process is done and done right. Yeah. Um, and I think that because of those kinds of measures just across the country, we were able to see the flipping of the White House. And I think that we all just needed that. <laughs> I needed that. I needed that hope. I don't know about you. <laughs> but I needed that. I yes. just, you know, so much has happened in 2020 that if we had a Trump re-election, it would just be like, you know what, just, just, just 
<laughs> just, just throw the whole year out. Just throw the whole year with the baby, the bath water. Just I don't want no more of it. You know, sometimes you just you can't deal with it anymore. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that that that's what's on my heart, uh, you know, with this election. Amen. Amen. You said a mouthful. You really did. You know, that brings back to mind that uh, text that um, I think it was James Russell Lowell, uh, who, Lowell who said it uh, originally, but uh, 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 King really quoted it, truth crushed to the earth shall rise again, you know. Yes, yes, yes. And um, it, it, it talks about that, uh, that, 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 that truth on the scaffold, you know. And yes. uh, and and how the mar uh, the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice and and so mm -hmm. it was certainly a reminder of how God is on the throne and as I uh, as I recalled uh, thinking about the Egyptians uh, I'm sorry the Egyptian oppression of the Israelites really yes. and and how the scripture says God heard them. Mm -hmm. And God saw them, right? That's so God was feeling their pain and empathetically waiting for the right time to deliver uh, yeah. God's people. And so I'm thankful for moments like this when we can really, really kind of reflect on that. So what lessons did we learn that we can use going forward or use as kind of things that we shouldn't do uh, in the future? What, what were the lessons learned in general? Man, you know, I believe a really powerful lesson for us to learn is that we, the people, have way more power than they try to make us believe. I think that so many times we can uh, drink the Kool-Aid, if you would, that, uh, you know, the Electoral College or the system or the federal government um, predetermines things. And we, as the people, cannot intercept and reorient those things. And I just feel like this election today, this week, we have seen that when the people really come together and put their minds to something, the system cannot actually keep us from doing what it is that we put our minds to do. And so that mm -hmm. is really the thing that's that's standing out to me. And what I'm trying to, to share with people as well is, you know, we as people of color have a tendency to really care about the presidential election. Right. We really get involved. We come out in droves. We you know, you get a Trump in office, trust us, we are going to Atlanta, Philly, DC, we are going to come out, we're going to flip this oval. But the fact of the matter is, is that our mass incarceration problem, our police brutality problems, our uh, 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 pro improper uh, allocation of funds for our schools and our local districts problem, that is all local government. Yes. That is all state government. Yes. That is all county government. Yes. And so that means that we've got to be intentional about who we're voting in for governor, who we are voting in for mayor, right. who we are voting in to be the uh, police commissioner, who we're voting in to be the sheriff, who's going to be the educational superintendent. When they have these town hall meetings and they're talking about the budgets for your county's public schools, are you present? This It is the these kinds, it's this kind of civic engagement that genuinely impacts the tangible everyday lives of us. Mm -hmm. Regardless of who we put in that, that Oval Office, that White House, they're going to put in laws and they are going to definitely do things. You know, we've got HR 40 uh, up. We've got um, a police uh, brutality act that is up in Congress. Right. So they are trying to do what's necessary to rectify some of these issues. But the fact of the matter is, is that the enforcing the application of these laws and the protection that we are seeking to, to have is only going to be secured by the individuals who are in power at local and state government. And Absolutely. so that is where we've got to come together and know who are the judges that we just put in, right? who are the people that we are just putting in locally. Right. And, and we need to partner and, 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 build coalitions together locally yes. in the way that we just built on a national scale. And if we can build it on the national scale that we just did, when I saw my state of Michigan flip blue, listen, y'all, <laughs> I said, if we can, <laughs> if, if we can flip Michigan 
Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, Oregon, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, blue. If we can flip all them blue, then we can do some powerful stuff and in our local communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. So true. And and, and what you said is a mouthful. And uh, Terrence Crutchfield said as much. But it, it, so 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 really at issue is sustainability. Right. So sure. so we probably there are some people who didn't didn't vote who didn't register, we could probably get a, probably about a million or two million of them to go and vote right now because of the euphoria around this shift, right? And this mm -hmm. result. But sustainability is critical and we have to stop getting so incrementally excited <laughs> sure. and, and sustain our excitement and That's sustain it. our passion so that we can get the local gains because it is not federal police that's killing black folks. <laughs> it is not federal police that's killing black folks, nor is it federal DAs or AGs, you know, who are letting them off the hook, right? So uh, just for instance, like Los Angeles, Jackie Lacey. Jackie Lacey was the DA for LA County. She is yeah. on record having said, I will never prosecute a cop. You know what I'm saying? She gone. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. You know? So, yeah. uh, so it's, 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 it's keeping the pressure on and, 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 and knocking at the door today. Okay. Absolutely. Biden, we rescued your behind. Okay. Mm -hmm. We put mm -hmm. you in office. What are you going to do? What is the what is the agenda? Okay, I know what you put on your website, but okay, right. let's talk about that. You know, and I yeah. know CBC, the CBC is going to be on the case, but we've got to keep the pressure on and not just depend on them to do that. And you're my guest. I'm supposed to be interviewing you, but I got so excited. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Listen, this is a conversation. We don't need to make this no interview. We talking. We just we just, we just talking. That's all we doing. Yeah. All right. So we decided uh, some time ago when we set this up yeah. that we would talk about womanist theology. And I don't think that there's a prouder day uh, or more appropriate day to be talking Absolutely. about womanist theology when Absolutely. we have the work of, I don't know, you can call her what? You can call it Black Moses. <laughs> you can call Listen, Stacey Abrams Black Moses, right? And huh? she was one of the first womanist theologians. Come on now. Hey. And then we had um, we had the work of Kamala Harris, who you know who did it in her own way. Uh, but nonetheless, she's there, and she was standing up, and she was pointing fingers in the in the in those white men's faces for a long time. They were you know, sick of it, you know. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so then let's transition into um, womanist theology just a bit. So, if you would explain to us what that is, the origin of it, because some people, I'm sure, are probably hearing of it for the first time, they've heard about feminist theology. But what is womanist theology? Yeah. So I'm I'm wearing my my womanhood sweatshirt today All for right. our conversation. Yeah. Uh, womanism is a term that was coined by Alice Walker in 1982 in her book um, or in her publication um, in the uh, the the secrets of our mother's garden. Yeah. Yes. I know yes. What yes. It's called. yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I'm like, I know this. Why, why, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> and. Um, so when she published that book um, in the 1980s, really there was a transition happening. So we teach that there are three waves of feminism. And so you kind of have that early suffragette movement where they're actively working to get women the right to vote. Um, and then you kind of transition. Uh, and now women are wanting the right to work. Uh, but while you get into the second wave of feminism in the 1950s, Black women are noticing that we and our issues are actually not included in this conversation in any way, shape, or form, but that feminism is quite literally a white, middle-class, female, um, intellectual activity. Um, and so it is very much so 
geared toward a small demographic. Um, and so you're sitting here saying, man, we really want women to have the uh, right to work. Black women have been working from day one. <laughs> right, right. Black women are like, I've, I've right. always had the, the right. I'm not sure if it's a right, but I've, I've always been working. That's for sure. Um, and I, then white women get the right to vote, but black women don't get the right to vote. Right. So they're noticing a trend that we are actually participating in these marches with you. We are aiding you in your political, social and civic um, uh, agendas. But we are actually not getting any of the social or political uh, result of this kind of work. And so black women then say, well, you know what? We are going to create black feminism. All right. So now you come to the 19, late 1960s, 1970s, um, and you get, you know, my, my area of uh, focus was, is it, was in literature. And so when you study uh, black female authors in the late 1960s, early 1970s, you get individuals like Intisake Shange, um, Toni Morrison writes her first novel in 1970, The Bluest Eye. So you're, you're having, you have Alice Walker. And so you have these Black women who are coming out and saying there is something specific that Black women need. So feminism is white, middle class, female centered arguments around equality. Um, black feminism is then the argument that Black women deserve equality and should not be discriminated against. Black women have value. Um, but then we come to the 1980s and Alice Walker proposes something that is really quite uh, radical and profound. And, and that is womanism. And it is the notion that not only do Black women have value, not only do should black women not be discriminated against and be granted a variety of civil and political liberties, but uh, that black women actually should be the lens through which we approach the liberation of all things. So, so when you really study womanism, you are not just talking about the liberation of black women. You are talking about the liberation of all created things. You're talking about the liberation of black men you're talking about the liberation of children. You're talking about the liberation of families. You're talking about the liberation of the earth. Many yeah. get into um, even the, the care and the stewardship of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so womanism is really a holistic approach to saying that all things deserve equality all things deserve and have value and all things should be treated as though they have divine properties within them and therefore are deserving of certain liberties and and values etc so then when you come to probably the mid to late 1980s black female theologians take this term of womanism and really create a systematic framework for a theological approach to scripture. And they entitled that womanist theology. So in essence, you just take what I just said, and they're trying to see how can we read the Bible in such a way that we're seeing the liberation of all created things through the experience of women in scripture, because the womanist theologian is going to read every woman in scripture as a woman of color. Yeah. And yeah. so the womanist theologian is going to approach the text and say, I see a woman of color here. Where is there liberation for her? But then where is there also liberation for the man that actually might be abusing her? What is he actually bound to that he needs to be freed from that is causing him to exert violence? Yeah. What is, where is there um, space for uh, the earth to experience liberation because humanity has been working it too consistently, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so it is, how can we read the text in such a way that all creation is liberated? Excellent, excellent, very powerful. And I think we, we definitely want to mention the name of Dolores Williams and Jacqueline Grant. Mm -hmm. And Dolores Williams, 
uh, her book. I can't remember the name of the book. Listen, I got it right here. I was, about, I was going to drop her <laughs> hands. Sisters in the Wilderness. That's Sisters. right. That's right. That's right. This is the and money bags. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that was part of, I did my uh, doctor of ministry at Claremont School of Theology. That was mm -hmm. part of my curriculum. I did uh, Pan-African Pan-African theology there. And that was part of my curriculum. I had to study her book. And I had one of the, at that time, one of the, uh, one of the leading uh, black womanist theologians who was there mm -hmm. in Karen uh, Baker Fletcher. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, so uh, very, very awesome uh, time. So, so, so if I re were to recap what you said, you said essentially that womanist theology or womanist thought then is a lens it is a perspective. It is a framework through which women understand themselves, understand yeah. the liberation of all things created. I love how you said that, all things created. Whether it's their own uh, psyches, their own minds, their own bodies, or that of their uh, spouses, significant others, children, the cats, the dogs, the environment, the fish in the gold, the goldfish in the tank, you know, <laughs> whatever Absolutely. the, the ecology and everything that we look at, it is through this mm -hmm. lens. And so, and so often when we look at the Bible, you know, we, we see white angels, you know, and the white God, white Jesus, everything white. And so, so how does this, this, this black woman, this woman of color, when there are th th there there are intersectional oppressions, right? Sure. So gender, uh, um, uh, color, and also socioeconomics, right? And yeah. so so then, how is it that they're able to see themselves at, on a platform of freedom for a trajectory of liberation? I think is is very very powerful. So how did you become interested in this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Where did yeah. that come from? Where did, Where that... did that come from? Mm -hmm. yeah. So when I graduated from Andrews and went moved out here to Maryland to or DC actually to do my master's at Georgetown, um, that is uh, an advisor of mine who knew that I was passionate and interested in studying um, how God shows up in Black literature. Um, really uh, told me to read James Cone and to read um, Dolores Williams. And so I got James Cone, God of the Oppressed. I purchased Sisters in the Wilderness and kind of went on this journey uh, to learning and understanding about black liberation theology and womanist theology. And I think that's a great place to even provide a distinction there because um, black liberation theology is attempting to do kind of what I just said, but because it has a tendency within its patriarchy to be very exclusive of women. And so Dolores Williams comes and she comes to James Cone and she's like, Dr. Cone, this is profound theological work. I mean, this is, this is the great- That greatest. was her teacher. That was her instructor, this is her, her teacher. professor. This yeah. is her instructor, Dr. Cone. This is the greatest system of theology that we as black people could need and use. One problem, where are <laughs> black women? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of left somebody out there yes, yes. Uh, of the entire conversation. And so Dolores Williams comes and she writes Sisters in the Wilderness and literally roots uh, womanist theology in the experience of Hagar and literally says in the experience of this African Egyptian slave woman, we see the black American woman's experience. So that so many times, you know, uh, sermons are preached that Hagar, you know, and Abraham were in a loving relationship, right? They was they were a couple, or <laughs> um, you know, Hagar was this woman who enticed Abraham, seduced him away from Sarah. Um, and it's just like I need the saints to read the text, okay? When you read the text, Sarah offered Abraham her mistress. In other words, Sarah owned Hagar's body yeah. and then determined that because God had given Abraham a promise over his life that she did not believe, that she did not have the faith that God himself could execute, mm -hmm. she then took it in her own hands to take her slave and give her to her husband. Her husband raped 
her slave at her request. Yeah, yeah. Come on, you're preaching. You're that's, preaching now. That's, I'm preaching now. I felt it. I mean, it came up in my spirit. Listen, okay. And 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 at her request, when the woman became pregnant, sent her away. And Dolores Williams writes at length about the very real reality that Black women experience by having to be these forced surrogates Mm. to American society, American culture, American bodies, so that we as Black women have had to mother uh, people that we didn't want to mother. We have had to mother things that we didn't want to mother. And so even when we think about this election, right. uh, it's so good, right? Because when, we, when you think of, when you think about a Stacey Abrams, a, right. a, a, a woman who uh, many have talked bad about for a myriad of reasons, whether it was her weight or the, or the gap in her teeth, or the fact that she doesn't have as much political experience, no right? Perm, they, no perm, no perm. No perm, <laughs> natural hair, right? This is this is your typical black woman because yeah. listen, the majority of black women look like Stacey Abrams. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And 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 what happens here is you have a black woman who goes to work, mothers, nurtures, and literally causes counties to flip in favor of a moderate candidate that they don't really even like. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. All for the purpose of what saving this nation. Mm, mm. And that is the that is the narrative. Black women are always in these positions where they are having to save the nation or save people and save families. And when we really study and look at womanist theology, we understand that this is a practice that has been going on for time past. Yes. And what womanist theologians want you to do is they want you to, rather than center Abraham in the text, when you come to the scripture and you're trying to understand who is Abraham and what does God say to Abraham and what does God want from Abraham and how am I Abraham? Womanist theologians say, put Abraham and Sarah in the periphery for two seconds and put Hagar at the center. Bring marginalized bodies out of the periphery, yes. bring them into the center of your interpretation. And then who is God when Hagar is at the center of the text? Right. And when you put Hagar at the center of the text, you come to an understanding of God that you would not have come to Absolutely. if she had not been there. You would, you would not see and know. When you were talking earlier, Dr. Thomas, about how Uh, God saw the Hebrews when they were enslaved in Egypt. There's, I felt it in my spirit long before we even got there. I was like, there is something to the African experience, the enslaved experience, the oppressed experience to where oppressed people need to know that God sees them. Yes. Because the Hebrews find out that God sees them and then he orchestrates his hand through Moses to to deliver them. And then when we get to Hagar and this woman who has just been raped is now cast out into the wilderness to die with her with her child. She's out there and has reconciled in her spirit that she and her child will die. This woman comes into an encounter with God Mm -hmm. and she says, I have met the God who sees. And I think this is so powerful, right? Because Mm -hmm. she's an Egyptian slave. They have a, a, they have an Egyptian God, Ra, who Ra is supposed to be the all seeing eye, the all seeing God. This woman in her experience says, not only I, I no longer, I see Ra, the all seeing God, he's got nothing. He, he, Ra did not see me in my oppression. Ra could not see me when I got raped. Ra did not see me out here in this wilderness dying. Elohim, and not even Elohim, El-Roy. she names him herself, El Roy. Yes, right. Sees me. That's and right. this is, this is the power. This is the application for us today, right? I'm getting happy. I didn't know I was going to get this happy this afternoon. Give Please. us some, hey, give us some water and a, and a I, Kleenex. <laughs> okay, listen here. I'm turned. This is the power in this. I believe 
that God wants black people to have a Hagar experience. Mm. I believe that too many of us have been coming to God with Abraham's names. Mm. And so we call him, we call God names that white European Christians and evangelicals have given us. And we have yet to really encounter and experience God in a way that is so unique and so germane and so authentic to our experience. Mm -hmm. That when we are in our broken places, when we are in our oppression, we are when we are in our wilderness and we encounter God, we name him ourselves. Yes based on what we have experienced. And I think that is the beauty of womanist theology. When you get into womanist theology, you approach the text differently. You then meet a new God. You understand God in new and different ways. And so then now you see that there are new ways to approach them and engage them and understand them that um, that ha doesn't have to be given to you, but uh, can be um, birthed out of you in in authentic ways. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So excited. And uh, it's a blessing. We can go ahead and take up the offering, do the appeal, whatever we need to do now, because we got a word. Amen. And there's more to come. Amen. So uh, everybody's loving it. They really appreciate what you're what you're saying. And, and, and what you're saying is precisely what um, Dolores Williams was saying when she talked about white woman's Christ and black woman's Jesus. Come on. You yeah. know, she's, she's saying that, no, baby, you got to know God for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she said it just like that, too. Yes, she did. Uh-huh. You can't Absolutely. you can't go by the white folks, what the white folks call him, what the Not white folks is thinking about it, how the yeah. white folks is singing and and, and praising. Uh-uh. You got to yeah. you got to carve out your own understanding of who Jesus is, who God yeah. is. And, and mm. it's the, in the same way that that Cone did. Absolutely. You know, and, and I'm so thankful for his mentorship over her. And his openness to her because he affirmed her and and awesome. he, he and, and he helped her develop that theology and it's such a blessing. And the only tragedy is that many of the people under the sound of our voices are hearing this for the first time. <laughs> Listen, and you and you know, really what you're saying there is also so so key because not many men can receive intellectual rebuke from not just a woman, but an inferior. Dolores Williams was his student, right? his female student. This is not a female colleague. This is not a woman who also has her PhD in New Testament or has her PhD in Old Testament systematic. This is someone who's learning from you right. that comes to you and says, this is profound, doc, but... Yeah, yeah. I used and, to do that all the time to Dr. Miles. <laughs> oh, word. But, yeah, I, but I wasn't a woman, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not, yeah, he's not going to be bothered by that. And, right, and, right. And, and so what we get then um, when, when Dr. Cohn comes and he writes the, when he does the, like an, uh, an anniversary reprint, and then he comes in the forward and he adds a new chapter and he adds new stuff to God of the Oppressed simply because of Dolores Williams. Yes, yes. You know, yes, yes. That, I, that, that I think is powerful. And, and I wanted to read this from the book. This, this is a great quote from in here. She says, but I think we womanist theologians want to be ever conscious of the way we are doing things in theology. Hmm. So we do not lose our intention for black women's experience to provide the lens through which we view sources, to provide the issues that form the content of our theology and to help us form formulate the questions we ask about God's relation to black American life and to the world in general. In other words, she's saying as womanist theologians, we are committing ourselves to center the black woman's experience in the biblical text 
for the purpose of coming to a greater understanding of who God is and how God interacts with African Americans in particular, but then the world in general. That Amen. is that's that's key. Amen. So 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 womanist theology can set the whole world free. <laughs> Listen, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We got to let go. We got to let go and let God let go and let the girl do it. Right. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. And, and, the, and the truth of the matter is uh, our black women, as you said, and as the, as the Lawrence Williams said, they have been saving us for so long. How many people, how many people did Harriet Tubman release? How many, how many mm -hmm. folks did she set free? You know? Uh, and, and so it's been happening a long time. And, and the reality is, uh, throughout my career, mm. uh, everything that I have done outside of church work has been because a black woman hired me, lifted me, mentored me. Hand, wow. Hands down. Hands down. And so, so I don't feel like if women get a voice, if women are empowered, then I'm going to miss anything that God has for me. I, I just don't, yes. I just don't feel that. I don't feel that. And I, and I know, you know, we're talking about the dynamics in America and, and the, the GOP is often using, they're going to come get your stuff. So <laughs> they're going to come take your jobs, you know? And, and so, and so even black men, I mean, what, 17% of black men voted for Trump. Really? 17% of black men or 22, 21% of men did not vote for Stacey Abrams, right? Mm -hmm. Two years ago. So, you know, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really even understand that. I grew up single uh, mom who was very strong, very empowered, uh, mm -hmm. separated, um, left, left uh, uh, Louisiana with, with, mm -hmm. with four children and pregnant, came to Los Angeles, became a uh, a license. She was a licensed vocational nurse. She was working wow. and she was handling her business. And so strong women was part of my life, you know? Mm. And so I, 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 th there's not been a time in my life when I felt like black women or any woman for that matter is coming to take my stuff. I just don't get mm. that. But that is a reality that I think is part of what we experience every day. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that there are just some who kind of hold on to these old patriarchal mentalities and just fundamentally believe that Black women are incapable mm -hmm. of holding certain positions and engaging in certain kinds of intellectual thought. Um, and it is, I firmly believe, attached to our theology. Mm -hmm. It is attached to how we see God, how we know God and womanist yeah. theologians uh, deeply trouble that and, yeah. and, and work tirelessly to reattach um, the feminine and the female to the person um, of God. Yeah, and that leads us right into our net. You really anointed. <laughs> <laughs> that leads us right into our next question because the next question is, how do we negotiate the conflict between womanist theology and Adventist theology in particular and European or Eurocentric theology in general? How do we how do we negotiate that? What do you give me an example? What do you feel like some of the some of the conflict the conflicting areas are between the two? Well, everything. <laughs> 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 Sounds like somebody asked me. They said, "Well, what laws? What laws do you think Trump broke?" I said, "All of them." <laughs> Claudia, what I, said, I said, "All of them, right?" So, okay. um, I get you. Yeah. So, you need me to give you something else? No, no. Okay. I get, okay. you. <laughs> okay. I get you. Um. So for me, um. I think that it was in studying womanist theology for some time that one, I initially in my study, I did not feel as though there was a conflict between what I was believing about womanist theology and what I believed in Adventism. Okay. So based on the definitions that I just gave right now, I don't feel as though that is in conflict with my Adventism. Okay. Um, 
I I think that there are, yeah, I don't think there's a better way I can say that. I don't think that there's okay. anything that I've said that I feel like is in conflict with my Adventism. What I will say is I do think that there are Adventist hermeneutical practices that are counter to what I have described. Right. So I think that traditionally Adventism does not teach to look at study um, center Hagar in the text over um, uh, Abraham or Sarah, right? Like Adventist theology is not going to teach you to, when reading the book of Daniel and, you know, you get to Daniel in the lion's den. Adventist theology is not going to teach you to see that Daniel was um, a captive uh, official in a Medo-Persian government um, who was uh, wrongly arrested and uh, incarcerated uh, for no other reason than his religion. Therefore, he experienced legislated racial profiling by the definition of the ACLU, right? Like, like, like right. that right. whole intellectual gymnastics, they're not going to do that. Right. They, they're, uh, I, based on my understanding, their hermeneutical approach is very much so uh, kind of rooted in European patriarchy? I was trying to be really nice, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how do I say this? Well, we mm, tries to keep it one minute. Um, <laughs> how do I say this without saying that? Uh, but yeah, but yeah. And I mean, you know, you had mentioned this even earlier about, you know, the white angels and white Jesus, right? You know, if you look at many of our quarterlies, if you look at many of our paintings, right? Um, Jesus is white. All the angels are white. The people that are leaving the earth and joining up to glory are white. And if there are persons of color, um, they are usually primitive, right. um, exotic, yeah. And they are not levitating. They're standing on the earth. That's not to say that they aren't being caught up as well, but their caught up has not begun yet, clearly. <laughs> um, and so, right, when you, when you have those kinds of visual, when you have that kind of visual messaging, um, you very much so assert a, a kind of Eurocentric read of the text. I think that this also inhibits our ability to really read and understand Daniel and Revelation, right? Because when we approach Daniel and Revelation, we always approach it from the standpoint of religious liberty. All of our conversations are around whether or not you can go to church on Saturday. And a day is going to come when you will not be able to go to church on Saturday. And that is the problem, right? So again, you have individuals who already have privilege, who already have power, and their main concern is when this one thing that they have will be removed. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing within Adventist kind of hermeneutical practice that makes space for individuals who have no privilege and mm -hmm. who have no power and whose rights have already been taken. Mm -hmm. And so you're concerned about not being able to go to, to church on Sabbath. I'm concerned about getting shot in the street. Thank you. And so your, your, uh, your approach, the way you read the Bible is skewed because you're now giving me spiritual advice and spiritual wisdom that is not taking the condition of the oppressed into consideration. And when, when I studied James Cone, James Cone suggests that if you cannot see the oppressed in scripture, then you cannot properly see God. And so if, if, if I'm looking at the text and I'm only looking at it basically from the perspective of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but claiming that I'm Paul and Peter, then you are reading the text very wrong. And that is what's happening. And so that's why you have, you know, if, if, if uh, when Trayvon Martin gets shot in the street, your, um, your word of counsel, your word of encouragement is the Lord is soon to come. You <laughs> Danny, Bert, how, okay, what else? How, how did we get to Revelation 22? Right. I want no, I want to come back. I, no, I want to come back to Genesis 410. Uh Abel, uh Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Yes. 
that's I want I want to come here. Right. I don't I don't want to go to the cloud the size of a man's hand. Let, right. I'm here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and so I think that that is what the encouragement is. If I if I could encourage anyone here to do anything, um, it would be to just go into your Bible study. You don't have to read all this theology and theory that myself and Dr. Thomas has read. The bare bones that you can do is go to your Bible and see who in this story is marginalized. Mm, Who in this story is in the periphery? Who in this story is oppressed? Who in this story is not being given rights? And then focus on them and then see what is God doing for them? What is God saying to them? How is God treating them? How has this person's life changed as a result of their contact with God himself or with somebody that God has sent? Mm -hmm. And I truly feel like that will completely transform your approach to the text. Now, there are some problematics. I had to take the long route to get here because, you know, there are some problems. There are, for me, there are some things within womanist theology that I personally do not subscribe to. Okay. Right. Um, For me, I am always very cautious of uh, what we call anthropocentric religion, where there is an elevation of humanity. There is a mingling and a mixing of spiritual ideas uh, because human thought reigns supreme. So the idea is that, well, we are centering Black women so much so that even if it is not faithful to the original language of the sacred text, that is irrelevant because the point is to center Black women. That I disagree with. I think that there is um, something critical to remaining faithful to the biblical text itself. What does, what is scripture saying? What is the historical context of the scripture and how can we maybe um, parallel that? But the fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of things that are happening to us as colored people right now that just point blank period cannot be copy pasted and put onto scripture. And so we have to kind of be careful about doing eisegesis and not exegesis, Mm -hmm. where eisegesis is where we're putting things onto the text that aren't there rather than exegeting the text and we're allowing the text to speak to us or we're pulling things directly from the text itself. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is that I know- Before you leave that point- Oh, sorry. I, I, I first encountered that same feeling and that same thought that you expressed with womanism when I began yeah. to study for the first time Afrocentricity. Because, because what was happening was um, many of the things that we had not been taught correctly about our history and heritage as black people, that, that's one thing. But then there was almost this glorification on the other hand. And I mm-hmm. said, well, why don't, you know, to, you know, I said to myself, I said, well, well why don't we just tell the truth? Because the truth sets us mm-hmm. free, right? So, so why don't we say that, you know, you know, we created the pyramids and embalming fluid and, and Hippocrates was taught by Imhotep. Why, 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 don't we, why don't we tell the truth about where the knowledge came from to establish uh, democracy in Rome, so forth and so on. So why don't we tell the truth about those things, right? And uh, but then also tell the truth about the abuses, the oppressions that take place in our own countries, in our own homes, in our own situations as African people, because it is the truth that it sets us free. And if we and if we if we do this whole idea of 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 glorification i don't think we get where we where we're really trying to head go because we are not really addressing the things that ail us you know oh, yeah i yeah. i'm so glad that you said that like i firmly agree with that i think that we must be cautious of replacing white supremacy with black supremacy like we can't say that uh white supremacy is demonic and then come and all of our arguments are basically rooted in the, in the idea that we've done nothing wrong ever. <laughs> hey, the funny part is, We're- the funny part is that, 
that Europeans in the in the in the in the time and the time dynamic and the time continue they just came on the scenes. So black people had a whole lot more time to do a whole lot more. A whole lot you more know. stuff. Yeah, right. And right. I think that's the thing. We 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 because Europeans have so demonized um our culture, us as a people, um our rebuttal has very much so become that of sanctifying all things black, sanctifying all things African. Mm -hmm. And I, I strongly caution against that. Mm -hmm. I do believe that there are some approaches to, and, and some things in African culture that I believe are demonized that should not be. But at the same time, I also think that there are some things in African culture that are absolutely pathways to spiritualism mm -hmm. that are just quite, frankly, explicitly um, worship of idols and or engagement with the with the demonic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I will never encourage anybody to to practice anything that is going to take them down that road for the sole purpose of rectifying um, a negative European narrative or image right. there are better much much better ways to to do that right um and so that that's my thing i i yeah. I, I firmly agree with you we yeah. we, we must continue yeah. to approach ourselves and our history and our experiences and elevate them move them out of the margins yeah uh, put them in the center and allow god to really speak to us the way he wants to but but not be so um uh, pro this agenda um that we begin to disregard the things that are clearly against god mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. good good stuff good stuff uh something oh so so then uh the elephant in the room is so then how did we talked about the, the the negotiation so so then how as a adventist or just a mm -hmm. woman in general well, let's say Adventism, because this is where I'm going. Uh, sure. uh, uh, pra wanting to practice womanist theology, mm -hmm. how does one uh, woman, or man for that matter, because we want to acknowledge that uh, men should be womanist, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. I want to acknowledge that. And I, I'd like to believe I'm a, I'm a growing, <laughs> I'm a recovering patriarchy, you know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm recovering, right? So, 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 how do we understand how the church has related to women's ordination? And, 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 and let's really completely and fully and totally muddy the water with how uh, the church, uh, particularly in the black context, it's probably happened outside, has dealt with. Uh, you know, the sexual allegations and the sexual abuse and the sexual, you know, misconduct over the years, right? So what mm -hmm. does womanist theology say to us so that we get clues into how this should be addressed, the ordination and the sexual misconduct and such? Yeah, yeah. Great questions. So what comes to my mind is how I, how I practice um how I am a womanist and how I engage womanist theology is like I said, one, Christ is the head and all intellectual thought is subject to him. So Christ is the head, scripture is the authority, and then womanist theology simply becomes a new cultural lens through which I can understand that sacred text. Mm -hmm. But because of the order in which it is in, the word of God and the historical context of that word is always going to come be priority over my cultural experience. That said, the woman is theological lens. What it does is, like I said, it centers a woman. And when you begin to come to the Bible with the question of where are all the women in the Bible? Just point blank period, where are all the women in the Bible? What is happening to all the women in the Bible? How is God engaging with all of the women in the Bible? And then 
I come to Judges 19 and I see a woman who is a man's concubine, who is thrown to a mob, gang raped, not by men in Sodom and Gomorrah. We're not talking about pagans. We're talking about raped by Benjamites. That's right. Men from the tribe of Israel, men of the church. So if I put this Levite's concubine, that's what they call her in the text, right? She gets no name. If I put this unnamed woman at the center of Judges 19 and I ask, how does God respond to the sexual and physical abuse of women in scripture? What I see is in Judges 20, the entire tribe of Israel outside of the Benjamites came together and went to war against the Benjamites and extricated them out of the camp. So immediately that tells me that when the church is made aware of church leaders, individuals, people who are abusing whether that be physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, financial, spiritual, any abuse of a woman, the church's reaction is to war against that individual, that entity, that group, and to remove them from their ranks. Mm -hmm. That is the course of action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, I, when I look in the New Testament and I, and I look at Christ and the Pharisees find a woman who is quote unquote caught in adultery. I don't know how you get caught in adultery, <laughs> but that is a sermon for another day. They drag her out, strip her naked, put her on the floor in the midst of the dirt and they are seeking to stone her. Jesus's response to consensual sex outside of marriage Jesus's response to sexual misconduct that quite frankly is within the church because she more than likely was sleeping with one of them Pharisees since they caught her no in doubt. adultery. No doubt. Jesus's response to that is to shield her. Jesus's response is to cover her. Jesus's response is to make the men aware of their faults and error and to not seek to punish a woman to the neglect of the punishment of a man. That is what we see in scripture. And I believe that we get that from just a bare bones, historically faithful interpretation of the text, but most certainly from a womanist reading of the text. Mm -hmm. And if that is what the Bible says from the Old Testament to the New Testament, then when we come to our contemporary moments, we have very practical examples about what we are supposed to be doing. So if we're talking about our uh, church's current situation, then it is the current steps that various systems that whether it be the conference or the NAD level where they are active, they either have or are actively in the process of removing these individuals out of their ranks. We have seen that already happen we are seeing that currently in action where they have said this kind of abuse is inappropriate, is unacceptable, and we will war against it and we will remove it outside of our ranks. When it comes to the sexual misconduct that might be consensual, Jesus says cover it. So then that means I as a lay person have no business in comment sections on Facebook typing what I think I heard calling out somebody else's sin. But instead, I am supposed to be covering the woman. Instead, I'm supposed to be allowing God himself to judge and condemn. Mm -hmm. And when we then move into the conversation of women is or women or women's ordination, it is before you before you leave off the consensual um, I, before we leave that, I want to hit the power dynamic, though. So okay. you mentioned you mentioned covering, but I I also want us to to make it clear. I want to be clear that I I don't believe that the women go out. I think there's a lot of extraneous conversations on Facebook, 
and so mm-hmm. forth. But I, I don't believe that the women go out to just, you know, do that. I, I think that's the last resort often, right? Because they haven't been heard often. And I'm talking about those who've been violated, right? Those who've been abu- abused and so forth. And then also in the consensual situation, we have to acknowledge the power dynamic that's often in play with men as pastors or administrators or whatever have you like that. So I just didn't want our I didn't want our listeners to think that we give men a pass because sure. even if it's consensual, they, they, they don't get a pass because it, there is a power, that power dynamic. If you're the CEO, if you're the therapist, whatever, uh, there is a power dynamic that has to be uh, acknowledged. <clears throat> no, absolutely. And, and to be clear, when I'm talking about Facebook, I'm not talking, if you are someone who has been abused and you want to come out and disclose what has happened to you, you have the absolute right to do that however you see fit. I don't care how you do it. So I stand by any individual who chooses to do that in that fashion on any platform whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about individuals like myself who don't know nothing and don't know nobody and are in comment sections talking about stuff they got no business talking about because you don't know nothing. You need to shut your mouth. You, I am calling you to cover. That's that's who I'm talking about. I'm not talking about victims. I'm not talking about people involved. I'm talking about all the parties that are not involved and not in one situation. Mm -hmm. I'm calling you to the work of covering. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, yes, but yes. I, I also firmly agree with you that um, just in in both situations, whether it be the, the, the Levites concubine in Judges 19, whether it be the woman caught in adultery, you have men of the church in power taking advantage of her. I mean, even even if, hypothetically, let's say the woman caught in adultery genuinely was engaging in consensual sex with somebody and there was no coercion, there was no power dynamics, like that's just what she was doing. The mere fact that these church men went into her private bedroom, dragged her out naked and dropped her in the dust for the sole purpose of trying to catch Jesus in a lie is in and of itself spiritual abuse, misuse of power, and extremely problematic. There is literally no angle in that narrative it's where the men in that story right. did anything right. Right. There is so much abuse of power in that narrative all over the place. Right. However you want to interpret, whatever you want to add to the narrative. Right. <laughs> right. You know? And so we definitely, I appreciate you saying that, we definitely must be clear mm-hmm. that power is often at play um, with these situations. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when we deal with the women's ordination situation, I will refer to... Oh, hold, the hold on, let me stop you one more time. Let me stop you one more okay. time before we get that. So, so what you just articulated, the lens through which you saw it, we not, we're not going to get there unless the men be quiet and listen to the women. Agreed. Like we're listening to you right now. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're not going to get it because we're not feeling it. We're not sensing it. We're not understanding it. And, and so like one of the letters that I read, it had no empathy whatsoever for the person who made this allegation. And I said, my goodness, oh my goodness. It, you know well, what? They're talking about policies and so, so protocols and so forth. And so and and the women often don't have the voice because they don't have the credentials and they and then they're subsequently not put in the leadership now go ahead and talk about ordination <laughs> listen you know um i think that there i think that there's much to be said around that that i'm not i'm choosing not to go into but sure. i do think that there certainly is something to uh, the church being properly equipped around that of communications and PR. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And yes, whether, yes, it's, yes. whether it's this situation or any other situation, typically um, we do not have the proper parties and talent um, in the spaces and places to advise, whether it be our local churches, our conferences, or our division leaders on how to uh, deal with things that have either are started out public 
or things that potentially need to go public um, by way of statements and things like that. We we don't do good on that at all. So. <laughs> and the funny thing is there are tons of professionals within the church, right, who do that very thing five days a week. Isn't that amazing? But I digress. Go ahead with the uh, ordination. <laughs> Uh, so when we come to the ordination, um, you know, I always revert to the theological committee that our world church established because they actually did the work. They did the work and they found that there is no biblical basis for ordination, period. Hmm. Um, there is no biblical basis for the ordination of any human being. Hmm. But instead that within the Seventh-day Adventist church, our ordination process is to be that of acknowledging that the Holy Spirit is in and on you. It is not a bestowing of the Holy Spirit upon you because we're not Catholic, at least so we thought. And so if you have a situation where basically the church refuses to acknowledge the Holy Spirit in somebody, what are we talking about? The conversation becomes much different. Um, and so when you take a womanist theological approach to the text, or in, even in my opinion, I don't feel like you even have to go all the way down to the womanist. You could just do a solid, faithful, historical interpretation of the Bible. And you could come to see that God himself appoints women to positions of leadership um, acknowledges the presence of the spirit of God in women, particularly when we get into the New Testament and you talk about the numbers of women who were financially supporting Jesus's ministry in the gospels, then you want to come to um, the, the letters with throughout the New Testament that talk about um, Priscilla and Lydia and all these other women who literally these apostles saw as equals, saw them as women who too were filled with the Holy Spirit and were doing uh, the work of building the kingdom of God in a variety of different ways bivocationally. Not the least of which was Anna the prophetess, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't we, Luke chapter two, we don't even have to go far, <laughs> all right? So I think that um, when we really come to the text and we allow the text to, and I think this is really the, the crux of it, like in, to conclude and bring all of it together. When we come to scripture and we prioritize what scripture says, scripture will always trump white supremacy. Scripture will always trump patriarchy. Scripture will always trump every kind of social or cultural ideology that perpetuates and protects um, discrimination. It's just, it's literally not, the Bible is not a European text. Christianity is not a white man's religion. The Bible is an Eastern text and Christianity is an Eastern religion. It is written by and filled with the narratives of people of color. And in there, in here, they are talking about how God is actively combating the problematic social customs and systems of that day. And if we came to the text like that and we saw the text for what it was saying, then we would not continue to, to, to purport and promulgate these, these unjust and quite frankly, inaccurate readings of the Bible that keep people like you and me, all of us here, from being able to properly see ourselves in the scriptures as God desires for us to. And then also keeps us from being able to see God himself in the scripture in the way that God wants to be seen. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Good stuff. I told you guys you would be in for a treat with Sister Claudia on today. Any questions for Sister Claudia that we did not talk about or did not cover, you want to clarify in any way? If you're on uh, Facebook, please indicate it in the chat room. If you're on YouTube, do the same. Or even if you're on the uh, Zoom platform, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to uh, have uh, Sister Claudia respond to whatever's on your mind 
if you would. So just type that in the chat and she will respond to you. And uh, so many of our questions uh, that I've actually prepared, we've already covered because what we've talked about has been uh, so comprehensive. And I appreciate that and, uh, and thank you for your thoroughness in, uh, in our conversation on today. Uh, mm -hmm. it, mo everybody said, amen, preach. <laughs> wow. Uh, speak it. <laughs> speak, Claudia. Relevant. You know, those are the comments that uh, I'm seeing in, uh, in all of the, you know, all, on all of the threads. All right. Well, uh, as they are perhaps um, uh, looking or, or maybe even typing, I want to um, ask you just a practical question. You mentioned uh, you know, not looking at theology uh, like you and I have or studying it in, perhaps in those, in those texts, but in, in a very basic way, what's the, what's the ground floor? What's the starting point? How does a person start uh, tomorrow uh, mm -hmm. developing this lens and framework so that they can not only see the, uh, the marginalized and disenfranchised, but also see women in their uh, God-purposed place. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one, I definitely encourage people to read. As you can see, I am a reader. I love reading. And um, so if, if you feel like it's within your bandwidth, I would strongly encourage you to read um, Sisters in the Wilderness by Dolores Williams. Um, I got so much stuff down here. I told myself I was going to recommend books and then it's like, you know, <laughs> which one do you pick? This is okay. This one for sure. I haven't read this one yet, but I'm excited to. I just got it recently. It's called Eco Womanism: oh. African American Women and Earth Honoring Faiths. Good. And basically, um, I'm I'm doing some work trying to get more um, knowledge around environmental justice sure. and caring for the earth and things like that. And so there are Black womanist approaches to that. And so that's kind of what that book is going to help me do. Good. Um, and so I definitely encourage you to read books, anything by Dolores Williams, anything by Jacqueline Grant, anything by Kelly Brown Douglas, anything by um, Katie Cannon, Renita Weems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't uh, mention Renita Weems. Will, uh, what's my, what's this woman's name? Well, uh, Dr. Dr. Gaffney. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, there are several uh, fem black female theologians that if you just start reading black female theologians, they will blow your mind. Mm -hmm. That said, um, tomorrow, man, what I would encourage you to do tomorrow when you wake up and you're going into your devotion, one of the things I want you to do, whatever text you're reading, whichever one. I don't even want you to pick a new one. I want you to go with the same one. <laughs> I want you to ask yourself, who is marginalized in this text? Who is on the periphery in this text? Who is oppressed in this text? Where are the women in this text? If there are no women in this text, how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. What does that say to you mm -hmm. about what the text is trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. And most, probably the, the greatest question that you could ask yourself is, how is God interacting with women in this text? And or how is uh, a God messenger interacting with a woman in this text? And I want to encourage you to journal. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to write out your thoughts and your experience with it and, and pray and really try to seek to come to new understanding of yourself, of God. How can you see yourself in this text? Because womanism, like I said, is not about just centering black women. Womanism is about centering all created things. It is about taking all oppressed created things out of the periphery and putting them back at the center. How can I do that? How can I see myself as a black man in this text? How can I see myself as a black woman in this text? And what does God have to say to me? And how does God's character, how does his nature change um, depending on their, on, um, you know, what, uh, what is being shared in this, in this scripture? And I, and I truly, truly, truly fundamentally believe if you just go to the Bible and really pray 
and read with this kind of a new eye, a new set of glasses. These are my, these are my new blue light glasses. Get yourself a new set of glasses and just come to the text. Then I know that the Lord will begin to bring insights to you um, that you didn't even think about before. It's just simply because nobody asked you the question. Mm-hmm. That That's really all it is. is sure. Someone's just never asked the question. Sure. And so I never went to the text with that question. Right. Good, good, good. And, and that's really what hermeneutics is all about. Biblical interpretation is asking certain questions. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so, so there are a whole range of questions that pertain to uh, disempowered and disenfranchised people. Those mm-hmm. questions we just have, and women, we just haven't been asking. <laughs> and so we have to learn how to ask those questions and then begin to formulate answers and listen to the Holy Spirit for that matter. Uh, yeah. regarding those. So, uh, Elder Philip is asking in addiction. Oh, if you would, Claudia, are you, are you looking at Facebook right now or will yes. you be on Facebook? Okay. If you would, if you're following this, um, what was her name? Marilyn. I think Marilyn was asking for those, uh, those authors. Can you type those, type those in the chat if you could, uh, oh, you can do them afterwards. You can do it afterwards. You don't have to do it now, but um, I have to jump on a, literally another. Okay. Panel. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. But uh, I'll try to, because uh, it's asking me to go in through restream. Okay. Yeah. Don't saying, don't worry. Not about letting it. me post. Okay. So, uh, all right. Don't worry about it. We'll get it up there. I'll for put you. them here in the. Ch- I'll put them here in the Zoom chat, and then you guys can just copy paste that onto the Facebook. Okay. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah, do that. I certainly appreciate that. We'll do that. Of course. And uh, and then uh, Elder Philip is saying is asking, um, you know, we know your book is coming out and give us the title of your book again and tell us about that. Give us your website so that we can follow you on your website and on the various social media uh, platforms as well. Yeah, for sure. So um, you can follow me on all on on Instagram and Twitter at I am Claudia Allen. Um, you can, uh, follow me on YouTube. I started a podcast recently, a YouTube podcast called cool. radical reading cool. and basically literally just trying to come on and talk about some of the books that I'm even recommending to you guys. I recognize that sometimes some of these, so many people want to read these books and just being able to digest them and understand them is very difficult. And so sometimes it helps like, Hey, you know, Claudia read this with me. And I'm just going to go to YouTube and I'm going to see what Claudia said about this thing. And so that's kind of what that podcast is about. So Radical Reading on YouTube. You can subscribe to my personal YouTube channel. Uh, My website is www.claudiamallen.com. Claudiamallen.com. So um, claudiamallen.com. I am Claudia Allen on social media, on Facebook. And um, yes, I have a book that I'm super excited about. Um, coming out called Activate, Finding the Savior in Social Justice. And it's basically um, kind of a look at the gospel of John as a social justice gospel. And, you know, really doing a deep dive into what does it mean for the word to become flesh? And when the word becomes flesh, it then begins to like deal with and address all of these, even all the things we talked about today, plus and, and more. Um, so that's, you know, kind of what that is about and, um, just kind of trying to dispel the idea that social justice is not a biblical thing, even greater than that, that Jesus did his ministry and social justice. Like, no, Jesus didn't do his ministry and social justice. (laughs) Jesus ministry was social justice. justice. And it's a matter of just kind of presenting that to you, um, for you to see. Amen. Amen. Outstanding, outstanding. I usually do a thought at the end, but I am not impressed to do that because you've done a whole lot of preaching today for all of us. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you, hey, you did enough preaching for me, you, and somebody else. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we're not going to do that. We're not going to wear the patience of the saints. In fact, in fact, my wife said, I'm still processing all this comprehensive information you, she gave us. So I don't have no questions. Wow. I'm still processing. So it's all good. But what I do feel impressed to do is to pray for you. God has mm-hmm. a special anointing on your life. You know, I've told you this before. God's got places that he's going to take you. You never thought before to do mm-hmm. things and say things you had no idea that you'd be able to. So I want to do that 
uh, I do want to pray for you right now, and then we will uh, close after that. Let's pray. Father and our God, we're grateful and thankful for your servant, uh, Claudia, on today. We're thankful, O God, because you have anointed her and appointed her and called her. And the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You've got a special work that you want her to do. She's doing great things even now, and the best is yet to come. You're just getting started. So we thank you, O oh God. And she's, she will be able to speak to generations, nations, and, 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 and countries, O oh God. You have gifted her in such a way. You've given her a, a clear passion and a clear voice, God, to communicate in, 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 in a really uh, powerful way. And so we ask that you would give her every resource source, the mentoring that she needs, the opportunities, the open doors and windows and everything that she needs to accomplish your purpose. We pray in the name of Jesus that um, you would cover her. We cover her with the blood right now and dispatch yeah. angels on every side of her to 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 keep her from every attack of the enemy, oh God, so that she would not be derailed from her purpose. And we're so excited and we're so proud of her uh, today. And we ask, oh God, that you would help us to to find out how we can be helpful and how we can be a blessing and encourage her and push her and propel her forward in the name of Jesus. And we thank you. We thank you for all those who are in her life and mm -hmm. uh, her her parents and her her, her aunts and uncles and her, all of her grandparents, all of her family members, nieces and nephews and cousins and all of those who will uh, be blessed uh, by being in relationship to her and under the sphere of mm -hmm. her influence. We pray that you'll be with her boss, our wonderful classmate Carmela Monk, and, and, and bless the Message magazine, oh God, and bless the Brinklow Church, oh God, and her work there. And we just so thank you for her. And then, God, we want to thank you for uh, what we've acknowledged today regarding the, the presidential shift transition, the announcement that we got this morning. And we, we mm -hmm. pray for um, uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. We pray for them that you'd give them wisdom and open uh, understanding and open their minds, oh God. Help them to listen to those who would give good counsel in the name of Jesus and help them as they do the job of undoing so much damage that was done. And we pray mm -hmm. for the black community and the black church, God, as we continue to rebuild, oh God, and push our heads above the water that yes, we've right. been under for the last four years. We pray, oh God, that you would position us so that we would maximize, position us so that we would leverage, position us so that we would grow uh, and build sustainable futures. We thank you, Lord, for this conversation today. And we thank you for our wonderful guests on next week, uh, mm -hmm. Sister uh, Donna Green Goodman, who will mm -hmm. come and talk to us under the, under the subject, I Thought I Was Going to Die. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering these prayers and granting these blessings. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Sister Claudia. You blessed us real good. And will you come back to us again? Absolutely. Thank you all so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Amen. All right. Well, folks, um, uh, don't forget next week we've got a wonderful uh, lineup with uh, Dr. Green Goodman. And remember to follow us on social media at Rainbow Community. Subscribe on YouTube and support us via Cash App and Venmo. And we thank you once again for joining us on this installment of The Sabbath Show. Until next week, God bless you. Love you. Bye-bye now. <laughs>